What's going on, everybody? It's Jamel Gibbs, your family-oriented entrepreneur. Welcome to another video. So today we're going to do a live Q&A. Uh, recently, I put out a, I guess, a, a, a YouTube community post asking you guys if you wanted another live Q&A, and the answer was a resounding yes. So we're going to answer all of your questions regarding real estate investing today. We're going to answer your questions regarding infinite banking that's a hot topic on my channel right now with uh, my, my man deandre clayton uh he's joining us today as well we're gonna try our best to just help you guys out today that's what this is all about live q a uh i know that i put out uh, a poll regarding the live q a's that you guys wanted to see and it seems like you guys are interested in all of them I put out one regarding wholesaling, creative finance, how to find the best deals. But today, I'm just going to twist it a little bit. And we're going to focus directly on infinite banking. And then I'm going to prom I'm going to make a promise to you guys as well. I am going to uh, release other Q&As. I am going to do other Q&As regarding the other topics from the most popular down to the least popular over the next, you know, coming weeks or months or whatever the case may be. But the plan here is to provide you guys with valuable content that you can rip off, you can duplicate, you can use in your life to be able to improve your, your current circumstances, improve your financial health, improve your family life, whatever the case may be. The information that we're covering is really based for you guys to be able to go from where you are to where you want to go. DeAndre Clayton, what's up, my man? What's happening, my man? How you feeling? I'm feeling great, man. I'm looking forward to this live Q&A. Before we get started, though, guys, do me a favor. Tell me who you are and where you're from. I want to give you a shout out. I see there's uh, several people that's hopping on the line and the numbers are growing. But uh, tell me who you are, where you're from. Use the chat bar. I'm going to give you a shout out. And tell me, you know, what are you struggling with right now? You know what I mean? DeAndre and I, we're going to provide some content for you over the next 30 minutes or so. And then we're going to probably do 30 minutes of Q&A. All right. So tell me who you are, where you're from. We're going to go ahead and give you a shout out. I appreciate y'all taking the time to, to join us tonight. So we have Bay Heart Media, Original Simmons from Florida. What's going on? Thank you for the topic. Gospel Homes. Um, awesome. Shout out, to, shout out to you. Shout out to Bay Heart Media as well. Shout out to Fred Green. Shout out to... Now, Fred Green is from Houston, Texas. Who else do we have in the house? We have Northern Downpour. Says good evening. But um, several people. Several people. Keep the... We have MT from Alabama. Uh, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, from Birmingham. Birmingham, Alabama. You see that, DeAndre? Yeah, they're they, they coming in, man. We got man. from Toronto. Yeah. We have White Chocolate Radio Radio Network. What's going on from Montana? What's up? We have Tiana from Dur Durham, North Carolina. We have oh, Gospel Homes from Dallas, Texas. Shout out to Dallas. <laughs> Chris Brody from Kansas. And they just keep coming in. So, again, we appreciate you guys. Keep them coming in. We're definitely going to take your, take your questions just shortly. We have Jazz from Bankhead in Georgia. What's going on? Uh, but DeAndre, so today I want to I want to really talk about how real estate ties into infinite banking. Now I know we we did a video together. It's a pretty healthy mm -hmm. video as far as views. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have been contacting you on uh, from that particular video. So let's talk about let's start off with the infinite banking topic. And then we'll carry it over into how that ties into the HELOC and how that ties into real estate. And I'll, and I'll uh, chime in as well when we hit, hit the real estate side of things because infinite banking is not my expertise and I'm not going to sit here and act like it is. But um, let's talk about, let, let's break it down. What are the basics of infinite banking? Let's start there. So infinite banking, what exactly is it? All right. So infinite banking is utilizing a high cash value, uh, low death benefit policy and actually 
basically taking as much of the expenses out of it as possible in order to create the close dynamic of an actual bank. And so what happens is, is over some time, maybe about year six or so, it'll break even with how much your regular bank would be, but then the dividend would carry it on to continue to increase the value. So a lot of people like to use it for arbitrage of uh, debt, uh, you know, because if you pay your debts off with it, then the one thing you don't have to worry about is it reporting to the creditors. So mm -hmm. that's such a really, really good tool um, for debt because a lot of times real estate investors become over leveraged, so on and so forth. But the more and more they move it over into a policy, the less and less is seen from a DTI perspective. So that's one of the most popular uh, forms of really how, you know, really how people initiate infinite banking is first to deal with debt. Uh, then after that, they're dealing with, okay, how do I make sure that I have access to tax-free, uh, basically, income off of this uh, asset, and I just borrow it, and it doesn't interrupt the compound interest on it. So those are the things that you're, you're working with. You're working with your money, being able to do two things at one time uh, while continuing to grow and while dodging some of the creditors, while dodging... You know, even some of the things that may make it hard for your kids to qualify for a certain degree of FAFSA. Uh, you know, so some have even learned that, that, you know, when they have an infinite banking account and they use that to do college funding, they realize, oh, my goodness, my kid can get full FAFSA funding instead of uh, when they use a 529 or something like that. They have to get a deduced amount of it. Or reduction just because it's on file and it has to go to um, all of those applications that you fill out. So it's just a number of things that's really, really useful for it. It's like a Swiss Army knife. Got it, man. So I'm going to act like I'm five years old right now, okay? And this is just for everybody. If we're talking over your head, I want to simplify everything DeAndre just said. So if we had to take that and let's say we're talking to a five-year-old, how would we how would we explain that in its simplest form? Okay. In its simplest form, um, when you deal with your regular bank, you don't get much credit on your interest, right? Mm -hmm. you, you don't get any much interest, right? Uh, so when you deal with an insurance policy, money only goes two ways. It's either the cost of insurance or it's the cash value. So infinite banking basically takes as much of the cost of insurance out to create a larger benefit on the cash value for the dividend to grow quicker and more. Got it. Perfect, man. Now, a little bit easier. obviously, there's a lot of benefit <laughs> to using infinite banking, right? There's a lot of benefits to mm -hmm. it, man. What, what are some of the benefits to using an infinite banking policy rather than a regular banking policy? Well, um, one of the primary benefits is that, you know, you kind of set yourself up for the future. Um, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, it's a get rich quick scheme and all these other foolishness. But if you say that, you don't understand anything about infinite banking. One, it takes a right. while for you to be qualified for it. And, and I'll just say this um, because a lot of people may not understand this, but maybe they'll get it is Anything that takes longer to get qualified for, typically the longer it takes is because it works better for you. If it doesn't take long to get qualified, it, it works better for the person giving it to you. So we can kind of give an example, for instance, like a mortgage and a HELOC. We'll talk about that later. It's going to take you a longer time to get qualified for a HELOC because you have access to money. A mortgage doesn't take that long to get qualified for because you don't have access to the money and they're charging you double for the house. <laughs> um, same thing for car loans, so on and so forth. And so um, you're really getting an asset with that life insurance policy where yes, it's not a term insurance policy that's gonna be active by the end of our appointment, but you're getting an asset that will have the ability to compound interest from the day you got it 
until the day of death and it'll never be interrupted. Got it. Got it, man. Now, what about the cons? Obviously, if there's pros, do, do you know of any cons when it comes to infinite banking? Gotcha. So um, obviously, the main con is that it is health related. You know, so if your health isn't good, that'll adjust your figures um, and how well it can perform. Um, if you are a person who thinks strictly just the numbers in the first, you know, I would say in the first five years, uh, you're going to see, OK, well, I feel like I'm taking a loss because mm -hmm. once again, a portion of it goes towards cash value and a portion of it goes towards the insurance. So if you don't value that cost of insurance and what it does, then you'll just you'll think that you took a loss in year one. But if you actually look at the details and see what it's doing and know that, hey, I'm having the ability to use this money in multiple places. I really didn't take a loss in that sense. So really, um, infinite banking, the biggest con is your mindset. If you think about mm. it as a regular mm. investment or any other type of product, um, and you may relate to this. Sometimes people get a diet. A diet is not a lifestyle. Hmm. A diet is very hard to stick to, right? When you have a lifestyle and it's like, you know, whether it be that you have an allergy or something like that, it's not hard to stop eating things you're allergic to. Right. right? You understand the death, pain. Right? Yeah, you understand it, right? And so... Mm -hmm. If you adopt that understanding of the banking system and adopt that understanding of the insurance policy, it'll be much easier for you. This will not be hard at all. <laughs> right? Got it, but man. if you don't, you know, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, um, no, finish what you were going to say, because I got this is this question is kind of related to what we're talking about, but it's kind of switching right. into a different aspect of it. Right. Oh, OK. So I, I was saying if you don't adopt that uh, understanding, then basically you're trading in short, in, you know, you're trading in short gains um, to give up, you know, to give up lifetime, you know, income that's tax free, mm -hmm. which isn't very smart. But that's what people would do in the beginning. Right. Got it. Quick question, man. So what now you mentioned that is health related what about age how does that tie into it like let's say somebody's you know 60 yeah. years old and trying to start an infinite banking policy is it smart for them to do it at that point well believe it or not um i've had some clients through the that came through the podcast 60 67 and still mm. got pretty good percentages on their splits um 60 year olds uh, my last one that did $60,000 a year, I was able to get them at 80% split, which Got is it, phenomenal, right? Yeah, that is. You know, so yeah, it's it's possible. And there there's some policies, depending on the structure, um, that you might even touch 67, 68, and be able to get a 75% split. So it just depends. Um, got it. You know, each circumstances, you know, it's customized. Cool, cool, man. Now, White Chocolate Radio Network asks, is this using a life insurance policy? That's a really good question, man. You want to address that? Yes, correct. It is using a life insurance policy from a mutually owned company. So if you are trying to do this with a stock owned company, it will not work. Uh, the primary reason why it won't work is because you will not have ownership in the actual insurance company. And so uh, that's kind of the linchpin for this whole thing to work is that you have to have ownership in the insurance company to be able to be paid that dividend. So, yes, it is a life insurance policy. So we're talking about whole life and not term, right? Yes, we are talking about whole life policies, but we are not talking about traditional whole life policies. <laughs> uh, so the primary difference between these whole life policies is that we are actually purchasing term inside of it. Mm. So you'll actually have term in the contract right alongside the whole. 
and the term basically takes up the lion's share of the cost of the insurance. Got it. Got it, man. So how does all of this tie into a HELOC? Like, how, how does the HELOC come into play in order to be able to benefit the, in, the uh, infinite banking policy? Right. Okay. So, um, so some cool things. Uh, some clients, their uh, credit score isn't quite where it needs to be to get a HELOC. You know, maybe uh, they're trying to get a 680 because uh, that's kind of the starting point of when you're starting to talk about HELOCs. Um, if they have a way to offload the debt into the policy, they can better their DTI much quicker because it's not like a debt consolidation loan. So uh, mm -hmm. sometimes people, you know, they might have a lot of debt and they say, all right, well, let me put this on a debt consolidation loan. The benefit of a debt consolidation loan is not in DTI. It doesn't change your debt to income ratio. The, the creditors still see the same amount of debt. Uh, the benefit is usually in centralizing how much interest the debt costs. So Got with it. the infinite banking policy, you're taking care of centralizing the interest to a lower amount than any debt consolidation loan could do. And then you're also moving it off the books so that you can get leverage, so that you can close on a HELOC or anything else like that. Um, now, and then, just, of course, if you already have the... Go ahead. No, go ahead, man. Go, go ahead. ahead. Um, if, if you already have good credit, the aspect is you could actually take a chunk from it and be able to use that to fund the policy if you needed to. Right. So let's say, for example... And we're talking about first lien HELOCs, first lien position HELOCs. So, for example, if you own a home right now, um, what you would do is refinance your existing mortgage into a first lien HELOC. And then you can add any other debts that you have into it and then use the equity from that as well as, you know, the debts have it all in the HELOC. Use the equity to be able to, you know, purchase real estate or whatever the case may be, which we'll get into. And then that debt that you had, you know, that you tied into the HELOC along with the first lien position, what, what the objective is, is to get a lower interest rate than what you're paying in order to pay the mortgage off quicker. Is that, does that sound about right? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I mean, and from a credit perspective, you're also bettering your utilization on the other cards. So right. some people, you know, they, they don't necessarily get how a credit profile is built up, right? And so if you got 40,000 of debt in consumer cards, but you move 40,000 of debt to a HELOC, um, your credit will automatically go up. right? Because the home right. is a larger ticket and mortgage debt is treated differently than credit cards and That's so on key. and so forth. And so, yeah. So, you know, the nuance that I've seen from a lot of, from almost actually, I would say 99% of the clients, I've done hundreds of consults. And the biggest problem that I see with people who have debt is when they look at a budget, the one thing they never count in their budget is the interest charge at the end of the month on their debts. So they, so they see, mm -hmm. yeah, they, ahead, they, they'll see that, hey, I $200 a month here. I send this a month here as a payment. But then once that, oh, that $300 comes out in interest at the end of the month because they owed it and it's compounding, they don't really count that in their budget. And they don't know that that's the reason why they can't, you know, take off. That's the right. reason why every time they send money there, they're still in debt, you know. Speaking of interest, man, um, you know, I, I was listening to something probably a couple of weeks ago and somebody mentioned this and, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting you know, and I knew we were going to do this live Q and a, so I figured I'll bring it up on this one. Mm -hmm. Right. So how does the economy with inflation and everything that's going on with the high interest rates and things like that, how does that affect getting a HELOC versus a regular mortgage? Is it more beneficial to keep your regular mortgage if you have a lower interest rate are the HELOC interest rates rising as well? What are you seeing? 
Gotcha. Okay. So um, are HELOC interest rates raising? Yes. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll start with that. Yes, they are. Yeah. Um, but first we need to understand how interest works, right? Yep. So when you're on a mortgage, yep. there's more than just interest rate and, you know, full disclaimer, none of us in our life have ever been charged interest rate. We have been charged interest, Yep. right? And so interest works like volume. So you have interest rate being one of the things in that, but then if I said, hey, you know, the interest rate is 45%, but the balance is zero, how much interest is being charged? Well, obviously that would be zero, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you say, okay, well, balance is more important than interest rate. So what's the other thing that's more important than interest rate? How the interest is actually calculated. That's the most important thing. (laughs) So in essence, if I'm charged, you know, for instance, if I have a car loan, I'm charged interest every month. I'm not charged interest every year broken down into 12 months. Most people don't really get that. So they end right. up paying for another car, mm-hmm. right? They end up paying for two cars mm-hmm. because they just don't know how interest rate works. So when you're on a HELOC, even though the interest rate could be 6.75 to 8.75 is what we're seeing on average, right? That's where we're at right now. Um, Even though that would be the interest rate, with the strategy that we're talking about, putting your income into the HELOC, you're not going to see that interest really. That's that's the key. For a reason. Because HELOC interest is simple. It's not amortized and it does not include PMI. Mm. Once you have a HELOC, you no longer have PMI. So right now on your mortgage, you're probably paying about $200 more just for the fact that you have PMI on it. And you're probably thinking, well, you got to have homeowner's insurance. Homeowner's insurance and PMI are two different things. They are not the same thing. A lot of think that. Um, PMI is the insurance that you purchase for the mortgage insurance, right? If the loan goes bad, homeowner's insurance is for you. So that, so that amount of money that you have to spend until you reach 20% of paying the property off, that's just a waste for you as a a homeowner. You're not getting anything out of it. You're literally paying for the insurance for the company that is lending you the money. <laughs> and, and, and guess um, so what? You're protecting the property with them. And here, here's right? the kicker when um, it comes to, to PMI, man. If you don't, so let's say, for example, you you don't put enough money down, which is 20%, which most people are not going to mm-hmm. put that down when they purchase their home. Uh, most mm-hmm. first-time home buyers, I should say, won't put that down, right? So you don't put that much mm-hmm. down. You get an extra 200 dollar a month payment from principal mortgage insurance you're paying the insurance for the mortgage in case you don't make the payment on the loan in case right now don't. here's the kicker if you if you don't make the payment your credit is still going to be destroyed you're going to foreclose yep. and lose the house and all of that money that you just paid in principal yep. mortgage insurance is down the toilet yep. for you But for the bank, they're not losing any money because they have that mortgage insurance, which is backed by the government. Right. Homeowners insurance is different. (laughs) Just going back to what you were saying, because homeowners insurance will cover, let's say there's a fire in a house or a water leak or water damage or whatever the case, you know, the the roof went bad. Homeowners insurance will cover stuff like that. So it's completely different than PMI. But at the end of the day, an infinite banking policy is going to benefit you even more so than a regular mortgage simply because you have simple interest, which is not amortized. You're paying down the debt a lot quicker in a fraction of the time. Literally, how long does it take to pay down your your traditional HELOC? (laughs) Yeah. Um, with the strategy that we, we do, it's usually a seven-year turnaround. 
Seven years versus usually 30. Usually a seven-year turnaround on, on almost every year. Yeah, versus 30. Um, and the when craziest you, when you take example a, we have mm – -hmm. go, go ahead. Um, I was going well, to say the craziest – Go ahead, bro. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, the crazy example we have is um, a client who made one hundred and seventy-five thousand. He, his wife made ninety-five, and then his particular situation was that his expenses were like six thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. So had really good income with lower expenses than average, and um, his house was like one point one million, but his truth of lending showed one point two six million. And so once we did the calculations on if he used this strategy, he was paying the house off in six point eight years. And it was only forty two thousand dollars of interest he was paying mm. versus the one point two six million versus two and a so, half times the money. <laughs> versus the, yeah, yeah. So so for a lot of people. As long as you understand how to monitor your budget and there is a difference between your expenses, income, whatever that difference is, you could possibly drop your principal by that every single month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, that's that's huge, man. Now, how would all of this tie in for real estate investors? So we talked about infinite banking. We talked about what a HELOC is and how it ties into infinite banking. How would a real estate investor use this approach in order to be able to build up, let's say a rental portfolio? Okay. So um, number one way is that, you know, real estate uh, investors, they live and die off of what they have access to. Mm -hmm. So simply put the moment that the bank says you're over leveraged, you can't work. You can't do nothing. You, you right. got to figure out what to do. You right. got to find out if you can find private lending. You got to try to be creative or you got to go really hard money route where it's going to cost you more to get the money. Um, whereas you could simplify how you are paying the debts and simplify how much access to it that you have. So it may be hard for you to go into a place right now and say, hey, I want to get 30000 or 60000 or 80000 for this fix and flip. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying you need to start off with fix and flips, but if that's your thing, that may be difficult. But now if you have a home and you have already paid off that, that type of money and you got 90% loan to value, you're in the game. You know, you can you can go back to that home, tap into it, do your deal, rinse and repeat and just recycle the money and continue dropping your principal um, and deal key. with minimal interest being charged to you. So right. that's the that's the really right. beauty of it is because you don't have to follow the terms that somebody sets for you to borrow anymore. Right. Um, if you had a HELOC and you already got access to it, the moment that the deal is done, you could pay you could pay your debt and go about your business, right? <laughs> and, and your principal drop right back down and you really didn't have that much expenses associated with that borrowing experience. So here's where that's I, kind of here's where I see a Here's where I see a huge benefit. And we had this discussion a couple of weeks ago in regards to a rental property that I've, um, I've liquidated, right? So mm -hmm. I'm taking the profit from that particular property and you recommended mm -hmm. to put it into an infinite banking policy. Now, here's the beautiful part about why that works so well. I put the profit into an infinite banking policy and there's obviously benefits to that as well. But just to keep this really simple, if I take, let's say, mm -hmm. 100 grand, I put it into an infinite banking policy, mm -hmm. I can pull 90% of that money back out of it, right? So, what does that mean? If I put a hundred grand in, I have access to ninety thousand dollars within twenty four hours, right? So rather than me taking that money and putting it into another property where the money is gonna is gonna sit and it's not gonna be liquid funds, it's gonna be in a form of equity. I'm gonna take the money, put it into the infinite banking policy, take ninety percent of that money back out. It's liquid. And then my money is actually still in the infinite banking policy. I, I never use the money. My money is still in the bank. Right. 
right? Versus mm-hmm. me locking the money up into a policy. I still have the power, the purchasing power of buying whatever I want with that money, but it's borrowed against my actual money that's in the policy. Does that make sense? So I'm still going to be able to purchase more real estate with the money, but my money is in the bank. I'm just borrowing from myself 90% of the money to put into another property while my money still sits, my liquid cash still sits in the bank. How powerful is that, man? That's... (laughs) It, it doesn't get any better than that, being able to use the money in two different places. Um, and that's why it's kind of hard to quantify uh, exactly how mm-hmm. strong of a product it really is. Because, you know, on, on paper, you can see, OK, man, these are some good values. Like when I showed you the numbers, you were like, hold on, like this is crazy. <laughs> but then the other side of it is that that's not the focus. Even even that, what's on paper is not really the focus. The focus is what are you going to do with the money that you take, Mm -hmm. right? And how are you going to make that money work for you Uh, rather than looking for, oh, man, I want to sit this money here and just get a return and sit on it and don't do nothing. The idea is I could triple or quadruple this money if I did something with it and I already knew it was going to grow where it was at anyways. Right. And here's the and so here's the best part about the, the whole thing, man. If if I if I have a let's say a rental property that I'm gonna use the money for, guess who's paying down a rental property? I'm not paying that money back, right? So let me ask you this yeah. before I before I kind of yeah, get the into point. what I want to say. How much of that ninety thousand mm-hmm. do I need to pay back within a year in order to be able to keep going? How much of that money? So the only thing that actually needs to be paid back is the interest. And how much is that? um, So uh, we're averaging between 5.4 to 6% right now on the interest Mm -hmm. rates for the uh, policies. But those are simple annual interest. So So the interest is only charged... If I borrow ninety thousand dollars, I basically got to pay back four to five grand. Let's say five percent, so forty five hundred dollars within twelve months. Yeah, yeah. Now check this out. Compound. Now check this out. Here's why this is so beautiful, and I'm not saying that you want to just pay back the forty five hundred bucks, right, to yourself. But Mm -hmm. if you if you if you're buying a house, you got ninety thousand dollars, right? Let's use a little bit of common sense. If I if I know I bought this house for 90 grand, chances are I'm gonna be renting it for you know a thousand to you know in my market probably thirteen hundred bucks a month, right? Thirteen hundred a month. Let me just pull mm-hmm. up my calculator. What's thirteen? Let's do twelve times twelve. Hundred that's fourteen thousand four hundred dollars. All I really have to pay back is forty five hundred of that and ten thousand is profit. Does that sound about right? Right? So I mean mm-hmm. you can literally profit. Huge. So, what's ten thousand divided by? We're, we're talking about what eight hundred dollars a month in cash yeah. flow. If you just wanted to pay back the forty five hundred dollars, right? So, this is why. This is what I'm seeing. This is why this is so powerful, right? Mm. And then, guess what you can do? If you wanted to pay the entire thing back off, you can always. I don't. I'm not sure if you recommend doing this, but you could always refi cash out, pay the money back. Free up that money to and, and go do it again. You see how all of this ties in. Now, yeah. what what are some of the? Do you feel like that's a viable way to do this? Also, what are some of the? Uh, what are some of the? Let's say the tax. I mean, I know you're not an accountant, but what are some of the tax benefits to doing something like this when you're holding on to properties? You know what I mean. Right. So the tax benefit obviously is. Whatever whatever properties you're gonna get, you're gonna depreciate them, right? Right. That's, that's just that's a standard practice, right? Depreciation. Yep. You're, you're gonna depreciate. Right. You know, you're gonna depreciate them. So you're gonna get basically, uh, you're gonna get a lower taxable income from depreciating the properties that you're owning right. while income off of them. Mm. Um. So that's already gonna be a really really big tax benefit because. 
the policy itself is not going to cause you to have an income tax. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're borrowing this money, you got interrupted compound interest. <laughs> it's, it's a loan. So you're never dealing with um, you're never dealing with the amount of money that it can grow by being diminished because you're loaning against. You're not withdrawing. Wow. And then on top of that, because it's not a withdrawal, it's never counts as income either. So Let me make you, a know, point, you don't right? have to worry about that. I know there's a, a small delay. I, I'm not, I don't mean to cut you off, but let me make a quick point while you're on this topic. No, sure. For everybody listening, mm -hmm. if you don't understand how this actually works, some of you, you, you probably do, right? But for those that don't understand this part, you, when, you, when you take out a loan, let's say, for example, you buy a property, you refi cash out, and you pull out some of the equity from the property. Let's say it's $10,000. You cannot be taxed on the $10,000 in extra equity that you pulled out because you're pulling it out in a form of a loan. You're doing the same exact thing with an infinite banking policy. When you make in, when you earn interest on your policy, it's in a and you pull it out. It's in a form of a loan, so you're not paying taxes on that money, and you're free to use it to be able to generate more income for yourself. It's a powerful, powerful tool, man. I don't know how how else. I, I don't know if you're not even thinking about doing something like this. Now, obviously, everybody's not going to fit, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But if you're not at least considering doing something like this, you're truly missing the wealth boat at the end of the day. What do you think, DeAndre? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, I, I think that there's no way that you're definitely missing out on the wealth boat because you're missing out on the fact that you need to hold on to your money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes people focus so much on making money and then when they get that tax bill, they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, they get sticker shock. They don't <laughs> to do it themselves because that spent it all. Right. Um, but the insurance policy allows you to actually live the type of lifestyle that you probably want to live while not having to deal with the taxation associated with that type of lifestyle. So crazy. you know, once people kind of get that, it's 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 really a crazy idea that you can grow money tax free, access it. Because uh, you're not going to find any other product that really allows you to do that uh, at the rate that what we're doing. Yeah, it's nuts, man. It is definitely it's mind blowing. It's a powerful tool. And like I said, man, everybody needs to be using this, especially if you're a real estate investor. I mean, I don't, I don't know of any other way that you should be funding. Obviously, there's a there's a ton of different ways to fund your business, but I don't know of any other way that you should be funding to be able to get these type of benefits from a policy at the end of the day, man. You know what I mean? But I do want to open best, up. Best exit strategy there is. I said best exit strategy there is, is some of you that have been real estate investing for forever, appreciating for forever, and then you don't know what to do when it's time to leave. No, yeah. oh, I don't sold the house. You don't know what to do with the money. You don't know how to kind of help yourself deal with the tax burden. This is a really good tool for you. Mm -hmm. If you put a large sum of money at the end, when you have to deal with the taxation, take those taxes out of the policy, pay them. But now that amount of money is getting a dividend. Now 90 or 80% of that money is getting a dividend and it's carrying on for the rest of your life. So it's going to help you tremendously as you try to exit out, too. And here's why it makes sense, in, in my opinion, man. And you could correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not an infinite banking. I'm, I'm nowhere near it. I know enough just by what I've learned from you. OK. Nope. But mm -hmm. here's why here's why it makes sense to pay the interest for the year and not have to worry about and, and just take your cash flow, not have to worry about paying down a loan. Over time, what, what's going to happen is, let's say anything were to happen to you, right? And the life, the insurance policy needs to um, step in. They're going to pay off the entire debt for you, right? So if you owe, let's say you you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, 
or, or in the uh, infinite banking mm -hmm. policy and you borrow 90 against it, what happens with that? You you want to finish that for me, DeAndre? If something were to so happen to example, you... So in that example, like... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say if you had $100,000 in cash um, in the infinite bank, you got a $1.8 million life insurance benefit if you died, then it would take the hundred thousand or the ninety thousand you borrowed and pay it off and leave your family with the rest. And you still got the money in the account. It's crazy. And you still have the property on top of that. And you still, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, you you will still be left with everything you did with the money. That is true. Yeah, that, that's you got, very true. You still have the property, and you still have the the cash sitting in the. Uh, in the bank and you're still mm -hmm. earning interest on that money as well it's a solid mm -hmm. solid way to, to to really safeguard your money guys but i you know again you know we we did multiple videos on infinite banking and real estate and how it all ties in you know you guys wanted to see charts of how it actually works and things like that i have an entire infinite banking playlist on my youtube channel make sure that you check that infinite banking um playlist out deandre and i are i know we've been talking about it but we are looking to form some type of class or something like that maybe a a live seminar or something like that in regards to infinite banking and really be able to deep dive and really be able to help you guys out uh spend a couple of days with with us so that you know we can kind of cover everything for you right but in the meantime i, I do want to open it up to some questions for you guys i see some really good questions that came in so if you have some questions regarding infinite banking real estate helocs anything along those lines i don't care if it's how to get started in real estate do us a favor leave a comment in the chat bar right there um, i'm gonna pull your questions up and we're gonna answer your questions one by one all right so uh the first one i'm seeing here is from ricardo Mc mcclinton um, and he says, I have inherited my home paid in full from the passing of a parent. Sorry for your loss. Can a HELOC apply mm. in this situation as well? Would I, how would I show the home in my name and credit, even though it is paid off? Um, I would personally put it in a trust if it's, if it's paid off, but that's something that, um, let, let's talk about, let's answer the, the, the HELOC portion of that first DeAndre. Um, and then we can mm -hmm. do a, a deeper dive into uh, whose name the property should go under. Does it? And, and, and if he's doing a HELOC, should he put it in, there, in a trust in the first place? So why don't we answer that for him? Good question. Good question. Um, so so typically, um, if you're trying to apply for a HELOC, obviously you're going to have to show verification of income. Um, you would also need to show. Uh, because I'm I'm not sure at this point if maybe there was a probate involved or anything like that, but um, there'll be a number of different things you would need to show ownership of the property, right? Um, so it wouldn't necessarily need to, well, if you don't have your name on the property, it's, there may be a probate issue at this particular time. So you wanna check into that first, right? Once you have the property in your name, you are capable of going ahead and applying for a HELOC in that particular situation, um, even if the property is paid off. So um, here's a news flash: when a property is paid off and you put a HELOC on it, it is automatically in first position because there is there's no <laughs> there's no balance on the property. So the HELOC automatically moves in first position and there won't be any situation with a mortgage popping up in that particular situation. So um, I, I would definitely first check to see, all right, is, you know, whose name is on the deed. Uh, if there's a probate, uh, if you need to go through that process, make sure you get it done soon. Uh, you don't want it to drag out because you're just going to be paying taxes on a home that you don't own mm -hmm. um, unless you're just running it out in, in the meantime. But you definitely want to check on that first before you make any uh, sudden moves. Absolutely, man. And I, I couldn't have said that better myself. And let's just say, you know, for privacy purposes, he didn't want to uh, put the property under his name. How would how would it work if he were to 
does a HELOC support land 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 trusts and things like that? So you can put a HELOC in a trust, um, and e even your income could be in a trust as long as it is uh, a revocable trust. Uh, so if, if you have an irre irrevocable, irrevocable trust, you will not revocable. find anybody revocable, right? Revocable. So, okay. so now if you want to change its ownership after you've applied for it and, and gotten it, that's fine. But if it is owned by irrevocable, you will not get any <laughs> HELOC on that property. Um, you know, so just want to make sure that that's clear because I've had that come up a few times. Uh, one guy was really, really creative and had one of the greatest trust layout that I had ever seen in my life uh, for what he was capable of doing, but it was irrevocable. Mm -hmm. And so it, it while it had wonderful benefits, it didn't allow him to get HELOCs. Now, he could sell the property and not have to deal with recapture tax or anything mm -hmm. because nobody was able to see who owned the property. The so, anonymity. You know, right. th there are some, yeah, the anonymity was valuable, but it didn't allow him to be able to just go ahead and open up a HELOC, so on and so forth. So if you're going to go that route, you do want one that is uh, revocable so that it can be seen if you're trying to go through underwriting through uh, a bank lender. Now and let's explain the difference probably, between it. What, say that again? Let's explain the difference. There's a little delay uh, for, for those of you watching this. So uh, sometimes it's taking a, a couple of seconds for DeAndre to, to catch it, but let's explain the difference between revocable and irrevocable in its simplest form. So in the simplest form, that's a good, that's a good question. So <laughs> a revocable trust, basically um, it, it allows a person to change the grantor basically, you know, as often as they would like to. Right. And so um, typically it doesn't have as strong a structure as an irrevocable trust mm -hmm. because an irrevocable trust, the grantor can't be changed. However, mm -hmm. um, there are some that will allow you to express that it is revocable, even if it isn't technically. Uh, but that's a little bit in the weeds. So we, we don't want to go too far yet because that, that will definitely be um, right. a state attorney question. Yeah. But, but yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the difference. The grantor can be changed uh, frequently within a revocable, whereas the grantor can't be changed in the irrevocable. Cool, cool. Sounds good. Another question from... Uh, Nomi Sosi. I hope I'm saying that right. Does Infinite Banking allow you to buy real estate property? And if so, in layman's terms, how does the process work? Um, why don't you talk about the Infinite Banking part? Now, I think we kind of covered this already, but you know, I, I could talk about how it could tie into real estate. Gotcha. So, um, so in the Infinite Banking terms, you have a place that is growing money that allows you to take loans against the amount of money that you put in there, up to 80 or 90%. Those loans can be used to purchase real estate or pay down enough to put down your payment um, to be able to acquire the real estate. So if you needed to put down 3%, 10%, 5%, if you had that amount of money sitting in your policy, then you would be able to put it down through the policy um, while offloading that debt. Right. So let's just say, for example, you had uh, you you know it's tax season right now. Let's say you got an extra I don't know twenty thousand dollars coming, right? I don't know if that's even feasible. I never had a <laughs> I never got a tax return. Always got to pay taxes or at least minimize them. But my point in bringing that up is, <laughs> let's say you got an extra twenty thousand dollars in extra money sitting around somewhere, right? And you put that into an infinite banking policy. Um, you can borrow what's 90% of $18,000 where your money. So what right. will happen is your money will stay in the policy itself. Okay. You will borrow. Let's say you have a, the opportunity to borrow 90% of that money from yourself while your money sits in the policy. You can lend yourself 18,000 against the money that's sitting in the account and use that to purchase mm -hmm. 
real estate. You can use that mm-hmm. money to, let's say you want to do a fix and flip, which I don't recommend while the interest rates is really high right now, but people are still buying. Um, if you wanted to use a fix and flip, most hard money lenders want to see that you have access to 15 to you know $25,000 sitting in the bank, right? So you can borrow the money against your policy while your money still sits in the, uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Your money stays in the policy. You're just taking paper yeah. money out alone against it. And you're going to use that 18,000 in this case as uh, funding to be able to get your hard money loan. Let's say you want to use it to put down a uh, down payment on a property. You can use the funds. Let's say you needed you know, you're buying a $90,000 home, you want to put down 20%, you can use the 18000 to uh, put the money down on a property. Let's say you're in a market where, you know, houses, you can buy a house for $20,000 or eighteen grand. You can use the money to pay cash for a property. You see where I'm going with this? So whatever in real estate, there's going to come a point where wholesaling, you know, is just one of the strategies that you're using. But even if you're doing a seller finance deal, for example, right, Uh, just to give you an example, I have one student who we were negotiating um, to purchase three rental properties, but the seller wanted 10 percent down on the rent on the uh, the total purchase price. And he would seller finance the rest. This is in South Carolina. Right. So my student needed. $30,000 $30,000 of the 300. So what do we do? We pull the money to put down the 30,000. We find the money from somewhere and the seller will finance the 90%, right? So that's a, a, a good example of when to pull money from your policy. The point is when there's buying opportunities you want, and you have access to the money or an insurance policy, you use the, the insurance policy to be able to get the money. Your money stays, and I'm going to stress it again, your money stays in the policy, but you're borrowing against the policy to be able to purchase assets that's going to bring in more revenue, more income for you on a monthly basis. Right, DeAndre? Correct. And the money that you use is growing by a percentage every year, and it's compounding on that growth. That's right. So, again, even with the policy that you that you worked up for me, right? So let's say it was a $2 million policy. After 10 years, I won't ever have to put another dime into the policy. And guess what? The money just continues to grow. So this is called real generational wealth, right? My kids can get that money. Every I can start policies on everybody in my household and just fund it for five, no, I think it's seven to 10 years. Never have to put another dime into it. It builds its own interest over time and the money just grows by itself come on mm-hmm. <laughs> come on y'all you know what i mean yeah. Yeah. this is stuff they don't teach you in school man but they need to be teaching this stuff in school for real you know they need to teach more that's about a, money a- and banking real estate in school because that to me is the only how to how to operate a business these are things that they should be teaching in school not how to work for somebody else you know what i mean um, so I hope that answers your question, man. Uh, just wanted to to make sure that you got that answered. I have another one from Brittany Alice or Elise. I hope I'm not sure how you know. I hope I'm not chopping your name up, but it says, "What is the process of owner <laughs> finance least, yeah. for mobile homes?" I can answer this one. I spoke with an investor, and they said that Thank the you. payment <laughs> would be made one. Uh, payments would be made on the land instead of the home. It just depends. Yes. If you're buying the land, then the payments are made on the land. I'm not a fan of mobile homes. There's people out here who make a killing on mobile homes, uh, but it's very hard to get funding on uh, mobile homes. And that's why seller financing would make sense with those. Right. Um, Modular homes as well. Same thing. Very hard to get. You know, modular home is basically mobile home. Right. But. It just depends on how you work it up. That's kind of a loaded question a little bit because if you're purchasing the land and the 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 and you don't own the mobile home part of it, but the tenant does, then you you're buying the land and they're paying you 
rent for the land. If you're purchasing the actual mobile home, then maybe you're making payments on the mobile home and you have to make payment, uh, pay somebody else for the land. Or if you're purchasing both land and mobile home, then, you know, it, it just depends on how you structured that deal. You know what I mean? So um, if they're saying that if this particular seller is state stating that you're uh, paying for the land, then that's what you're buying. You're buying the land. And if you're buying the land, I would be buying it cheap. I wouldn't be paying the same price that I would if I were to buy the home and the land as well. I hope that answers your question. It says purchasing the home and the land. Yeah. So um, they're probably working it to where you're, you're buying the land and the home and they're working the payment for the home into the purchase price as well. That's something that you have to clarify with them. Okay. Um, I hope that answers your question though. Uh, handyman coin says, can you move 401k fund into infinite banking? That's your expertise, my man. Yeah, this, this is a very popular question, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so, um, usually when you deal with rollovers, you, you kind of have a light to light comparison. Now, can you move over uh, those funds into a life insurance policy? You can, but it would create a taxable event, right? Um, because the life insurance policy is post-tax and the 401k is pre-tax. And that's just kind of how the government has set it up. Are there some ways to liquidate some of it? in some different ways. So uh, we are on a real estate podcast. So one thing that I do with some individuals, rather it be they're moving into a home or they need uh, money for an investment property, right? So 401k administrators normally have a rule where they would give you half of what you have up there to the cap of $50,000, right? So basically, if you got $100,000 in your 401k, you can borrow against your 401k uh, at $50,000. Now, that's to purchase a home, rather it be an investment property or if it is your own individual home. Now, the reason why I mentioned that is because with you trying to do you know, real estate investing, HELOC, so on and so forth, um, if it is your personal residence, then you could actually get a you know 90% loan to value on the HELOC by putting 10% down from your 401k. Or maybe you could even put more down from your 401k and now you would have more liquid from the 401k and take it out of the market because you're losing money right now, right? So that is an option to be able to liquidate some of your funds and to kind of change how your life is working uh, from a standpoint of mortgage to first lien HELOC. Uh, so, you know, that is one way that you can do it. Uh, if you're talking about a property that is um, an investment property, you just kind of re reconfigure the numbers. The numbers are usually going to be a 70-30 or a 75-25 for what the HELOC lender or the first position HELOC lender would be willing to do on an investment property. So if you borrowed the money from your 401k, you could do that and then now put a person in that home, rent out that home and allow them to pay back that loan from 401k, but also get passive income at the same time. So you would be able to get a property you will be able to drop how much your actual um, your income tax would be because you'd be able to depreciate the property as well. Uh, so it would show up and look like you're making less money to the government at that point, even though now you're having passive income. So that, that is one way that you can liquidate. But if you're just doing a, a like for like, so if you're just saying 401k right into the insurance policy, it will create a taxable event. So some people are willing to take it. Some people are not willing to take it. Um, many decide not to. And there are also many who do because they don't like the 401k system. 
They don't like mm. being stuck inside of a fund mm. uh, that they have no control over and that a lot of fees is going towards the administrators um, instead of making sure that they have their money in a safe place that doesn't interrupt their compound interest. So I just wanted to make sure I answered that clearly. And, and I would love to speak with you, uh, uh, Handyman Coin, about that as well. Yeah, and, and I actually recommend that, by the way. So how can our viewers uh, get in contact with you, man? I'll, I'll make sure I leave a link in the description box. But how else should they should they just click on the link or is there a specific place that they can reach out? Yeah, so so we'll we'll probably do two links in the description box. It'll be ClaytonFinancialSolutions.com, uh, which is my website, and then the other is just going to be a straight schedule link. So if you just want to want to get on my calendar, we can do that as well. Uh, but Perfect. you know, I I definitely like that question, Handyman Coin. Yeah, that was a good question, man. There was another one that came in. I want to make sure I get to it real quick. It says, uh. Jamel Gibbs, this is from Christian Seal. Will you coach me? Um, I may have some <laughs> space open in my coaching program. Uh, send an email to info at reieducationacademy.com or just go to reieducationacademy.com slash coaching. Fill out an app and uh, we'll see what we can do for you, man. Um, next question came from Ascend. Digital marketing agency. This is a good question too. It says, will the okay. HELOC still work if it's not structured as a first lien, uh, first place lien? I still have a mortgage, but was approved for a HELOC. Um, that's well. I'll let you answer that. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, will it work? Can it work? Yes, it can. Is it as efficient? No. Right. And so um, that's that's kind of the short of it. But the reason why it's not as efficient is when you start using that money uh, from your second position HELOC, you still have your mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. Right. So now you have to pay two different things. So so, you know, we like consolidating it into one uh, one HELOC because we get rid of the amortization or the first position, we, we like to consolidate to first position because we remove the amortization, which is costing you an extreme amount of money that you may not even really notice is going on. But on top of that, it's allowing you to pay the HELOC off at your pace. So it's going to be harder to pay a second position HELOC off at your pace because you have mm -hmm. to pay your mortgage. I hope that makes sense, right? Yeah, basically, you want to have a first lien HELOC. That's where it makes sense the most in order for you to be able to pay down that HELOC as quickly as possible. It doesn't make sense to do it. if It, it, it can work, but I wouldn't necessarily do it in a, a second, he, second lien HELOC position. That's basically what DeAndre is saying. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for us, guys? Don't be shy. We have a couple more minutes that we're going to spend with you guys here. Uh, real estate related, HELOC related, anything you want to know, you ask it while you got us. Let us know what you're struggling with. I'm happy to help you. I get a ton of questions on in, oh, in the comment section of my videos. Um, what's up, Jess? Um, I'm going to pull up Jess's question. But I get a ton of questions, but, you know, again, guys, is you know, man. it's pretty difficult to answer every question on, on YouTube. So this is why we do these live Q&As. Just says, is a first position lien HELOC possible with non-primary residences such as multifamily properties and commercial properties? Um, short answer to that is I was I'm actually considering doing it on rental properties. You know what I mean? But DeAndre, mm -hmm. why don't you answer that? Yeah, I mean, well, you kind of answered it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, <laughs> so yes, um, you can uh, get a first position HELOC on a investment property. <clears throat> Just the primary difference is the loan to value. So, um, you know, banks, when they're lending out a first position HELOC, their mindset is that if you live in the home, obviously you're not going to tear it up. 
So they are more willing to give you 90% in that situation. If you don't live in the home and it's an investment property, then you know they're they're more hesitant. So you're going to look at 70 to 75%. If you live in the home and it is a multifamily, so let's say if you're kind of house hack, so to speak, and, you, and one unit, and then you have everybody in the other units, because that is technically still residential, normally your percentage will go about 80%. Right. Exactly, man. So I hope that answers your question, Jess. And uh, M. LaFontaine says, use your HELOC for velocity banking because <clears throat> paying your mortgage off much faster. What are your thoughts on that? So, 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 so before you even velocity answer that, bank- what is the difference between velocity banking and infinite banking for everybody who's not clear with that? Okay, so um, yeah, th- and there's there's some misnomers. So velocity banking is really focusing primarily on the credit profile, right? So um, you're basically applying your entire income to making sure that your credit profile gets good. So you might get a personal line of credit that is very large, so on and so forth, to kind of offset some debts there. And then you might have points on that one. So you're really being more efficient with every dollar and reference to it. And you can do that with, you can add infinite banking into it. You can add maximization into it when you're talking about the, uh, the utilization of the first position HELOC. But um, so I I just want to make sure that that's clear. So yes, you use a HELOC, but a HELOC is a different method. That's a, the cash flow maximization uh, method really is what the HELOC is doing. Um, and you can apply it to velocity banking where you're using certain types of credit cards to get the best out of them or lines of credit to get the best out of them and to lower the amount of interest that you're charged within a given you know year or whatever that you're going to offset your expenses off onto. Uh, so that's kind of what velocity banking is doing. And yes, it is supercharged by the HELOC. And Mm -hmm. infinite banking is when you're using the life insurance policy. So it is possible to velocity bank without a life insurance policy. So we want to make sure that that's clear. Yes, it is possible to velocity bank without a life insurance policy. Um, And it's even possible to velocity bank without a HELOC. So does a HELOC make it more efficient? Yes. Does a life insurance policy make it more efficient? Yes. Basically, for each layer that you add, you're recycling the money more. So if you combine all three of them, which is kind of what we're getting into, is you're basically recycling the money three times instead of twice or instead of just using your money outright. Right. So they work hand in hand with each other. Definitely, man. They work hand in hand in in order to make the policy more uh, efficient. Yeah. And I appreciate that comment. Um, yeah, for I, sure. I don't know what your first name is, but LaFontaine, I appreciate that. Yeah, that was a good one. For sure, man. Chris mm-hmm. Brody says, I have an infinite bank, and it's awesome. I definitely appreciate your uh, input on that, for sure, man. Thanks, uh, Jennifer, Chris. yeah, for sure, man. Shout out to Jennifer Mobley. She says, two parties, one with low credit score one uh with high income let me start that from the top two parties one with low credit score my bad jennifer uh two parties one with low credit score with high income one with low income high credit score how do they apply for a heloc both are on the deed one is living at the residence now jennifer is actually one of my coaching partners so shout out to her gotcha. how, do, how do we answer that question mm-hmm. for her Okay, so um, so first, the first scenario probably would be easier, right? Um, because if you're talking about the HELOC method, it has a high focus on your income and the cash flow. So basically, what is the what is the digit of your income, and what is the difference between your income and your expenses, and that's your cash flow. So the higher your income, the better that method will work for you. Um, if your income is lower, it can 
work for you. Um, but your expenses have to be significantly lower as well. So that's number one. Now, now if you're doing, you know, if you're trying to get a HELOC and you have high income but a low credit score, you can get to the credit score by making sure that you get an insurance policy and offloading the debts that you have that's mm -hmm. messing up your credit profile. Mm -hmm. Or you can hire creditsores.com. Uh, I've sent a ton of people there and they have gotten 40 points bumps in, in the first month oftentimes yeah. and it's all legal yeah. and it's nothing crazy right um so that is a credit stores, easier problem to deal with credit source is my sister's business for everybody who uh who wants to get involved with that she has her own credit company it, it does you she's know terrible. it does she's she's doing really well and it's relatively inexpensive for the everyday person yeah i think and it's I, like 30 bucks a month or something like that yeah, I help my just so you know, man. I helped my sister learn how to how to uh, repair her credit uh, back in the day, and she took it and yeah. turned it into a business, man. And now she's she has thousands of customers, man. It's exciting to see that. Shout out to my man, sister. I tell, well, she's killing. <laughs> <laughs> she is killing. She is killing because I, I've sent some folks over there, and they've they've definitely sung her praises. So I appreciate her for sure. Um. Now, in reference to low income, high credit score. So um, can you get a HELOC? Yes, but it will depend on what is the amount that we're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had a person who had, uh, what's the name of the credit company? Oh, creditsource.com, Tiana. Sorry about that. <laughs> credit credit S-O-A-R-S. Um, Creditsource.com. Um, but yeah, so in reference to the one with the low income, high credit score, uh, when you're applying for a first position HELOC, the, the good thing about it is that you're really applying. The only thing that you're being lended on is what is owed on the property. Right. So now it may be difficult if you're going for it the first, you know, if you're trying to buy a property outright into a first lien HELOC, that that will be very hard if you have low income. Uh, but if you are moving from one property to the next, one of the good things about this is that, you know, your equity can also count towards that payment to be able to enter the uh, the first position. My man left. I, I was just about to say it, Mike. <laughs> I like Mike. <laughs> um, but yes, your your equity from the value going up in the property can also serve to close the gap on what you need to to be able to qualify for the HELOC. That's right. um, both are in a deal. Right. One is living at the residence. I'm not sure how to answer the last part, if or I hope I answered it. And you can definitely say in uh, the chat, Jennifer, if there was something else you needed out of there. Perfect, perfect, man. And Rich Days, is there a limit to number of first lien HELOCs you can get? That's actually a really good question. Oh, man. Um, if it's on different, it I'm going to answer it from a real estate aspect. If you're pulling from different properties, let's say, for example, you own 10 properties, you want a first lien HELOC on each property, I don't see that there is a limit on that unless I'm missing something. What do you think? Yeah, I, I don't really see that there's a limit on it because if you if the mortgage is in your name, you can change it. <laughs> you know what I'm Pretty much. So so you know that that would that would be kind of that would be my answer for that. Of course, mm -hmm. um I always encourage people that if they're if they're going to go after the first lien HELOC uh, journey, the first one you should get is on your own home. And the reason why is because nine times out of 10, what you're investing in is not going to have as big a threshold as the home you live in. You, you probably want to live somewhere nicer than what you're selling. Right. And so now if you're in an $800,000 house, $700,000 house, and you're you're having to put a first lien HELOC on there and now you have access to whatever that difference is from a value perspective and how much you owed. 
um, you know, that could serve to be able to get you plenty of properties. I, I think in one example, we had a client where, you know, immediately because she had a $500,000 home and then it went up to $960,000 mm -hmm. and it was a home in California. Um, when she went to apply, I mean, she basically felt like she received $140,000 was extra over the amount of equity that she actually paid into it. So um, I would say start there first because that open door policy with your income, you're not going to feel like you need as many HELOCs if you allow your income to keep clearing the HELOC in your, on your house and keep lowering your actual expenditures in your house. Uh, so, you know, that would be my answer there. But I, I don't see you having a limit, but I would definitely say start with your home. Uh, you'll get yeah. the best out of it. You'll get a higher LTV and everything. For sure, man. Uh, shout out to Tiana Kemp. She already che checked out my sister's website. This is my little sister, my blood Tiana, sister. Quit. She says they have great rates. <laughs> yeah, I told you it, it's really for the everyday person. It, it really is affordable. Anybody, anybody. My sister understands that, you know, people, when people have dings on their credit, it can be an income situation. So she really made it affordable for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's definitely uh, useful. So I'll put that in the description box as well. Shout out to my little sister. Shout out to DeAndre. Um, I'm going to make sure his links are in the description box. Shout out to myself because I try my best to provide you guys with <laughs> a ton of content that makes sense. And it's just not a bunch of fluff on, on online. Right. We, we try to provide viable information that people can implement into their lives and not, you know, we not provide the fluff along with it. Uh, HELOC depends on this is my man, Mike. Once again, he says HELOC depends on the banks. They will normally lend 70 to 80 percent of the equity on your property, LTV and DTIR. I think we kind of covered that. It actually can go up to 90 percent. Um, but yeah. shout out to Mike for, for that comment as well. Yeah. Did you yeah, want to add something Mike. to that? Um, yeah, I, I was going to say definitely. Um, so the primary bank that I favor because of their technology and everything, uh, they're lending at 90 percent, but that's on residential and they're looking to expand into uh, investment. But I, I know it won't be 90 percent when they look to expand to investment. But um but they just have the perfect technology where it's like you have not just a HELOC, you also have a banking account and then it's integrated so that the HELOC actually becomes like your, um, it, it becomes like your overdraft account, just like mm -hmm. your savings and your regular checking. So uh, you can have your bills coming out of it and then the, and then the equity in your house could serve as the overdraft account so that you never, I have to worry about your bills not being paid. And I, I think that works better for most uh, homeowners so that their back isn't against the wall at any point throughout the process. Got it, man. Good stuff. Handyman Coin asked another question. Does a CISA or CISA work on HELOC? I don't know what that is. So you're going to have to help me out with that one. I'm, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me, yeah. let me see what I'm, what. I just Googled it, man. I don't know what it is, bro. <laughs> What's the system? Yeah, what's the system? Yeah. <laughs> uh, shout out for a good question, man. Uh, but any other questions, yeah, guys, before so we hop off the line? We probably got about 10 more minutes. Gonna hop off in about 10 more minutes. Anything real estate related, infinite banking related, ask it now. It, if you guys are talking about stated income, income, say that again. Stated I think income. He's talking about stated income. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I've never you even heard have of it. Stated years in real estate. I've never heard of a system, man. It's got to be stated income. It could be. Yeah, I, I think that's what he's talking about. Um, okay. Stated, stated income. income stated ass. Stated <laughs> yeah. asset, yep. You the man, handyman coin. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, normally, if you're gonna do the. Uh, the HELOC, you know, they're definitely going to be looking for state of income. Um, they're not necessarily going to loan to you based on assets per se. Um, oh my goodness, who is that? 
<laughs> yeah, so they're, they're not a loan to you based on, oh, I have this much assets. And, and of course, there's some different ways to get lines of credit. You can get bridge loans with some companies. Um, it, there's a number of different avenues out there that are similar. Uh, you just have to make sure that you un how to strategize with each one of them. But uh, yeah, you would have to state your income via rather be W-2, so on and so forth. There needs to be something showing how you're being paid to get the HELOC. I got a good question, man. This is something that nobody asked. Let's say somebody has great credit, but very little money. Would it make sense for them to get, let's say, a mm -hmm. line of credit? I mean, I, I kind of know the answer to this, but this is a really good question for everybody. Would it make sense for somebody to pull a credit line and use that for an infinite banking policy. The only way I can see that and, and, and before, you know, just to answer my own question before you answer, the only way I can see something like that gotcha. being beneficial is if you got a really low interest rate on a credit line and you're looking to use that money to flip it up. What do you think? Right. So, so I appreciate that question, actually. There, so there, there is a strategy, and I'm not a fan of it. So let me go ahead and start. By saying, <laughs> let me go ahead and start by saying that um, there is a insurance strategy called Kaizen, um, mm -hmm. and most people have used mm -hmm. it with IULs. I'm not really big on it because basically you allow the bank to lend just on your credit. Um, to lend you the amount of money needed to fund your policy, whatever amount that you want to fund that policy. Uh, but you would have to pay the interest every year back to the bank. The problem with those kind of situations is that you are no longer the owner of the policy. Um, the bank would be the owner of the policy, right? And so um, as, not, as you being not the owner of the policy, you wouldn't have any rights to draw the money while there's a balance owed. So mm -hmm. what Kaizen depends on or that strategy where you're kind of taking a loan to be able to fund the policy um, via, you know, like via directly taking a loan to be able to fund the policy, what it would depend on is how well the policy performs. And so they use it with IULs because IULs have the ability to possibly perform better than a whole life policy structure the way I structure it. However, it is not guaranteed that it will mm. because there's expenses with it, so on and so forth. So um, yes, you could. Would I suggest it? Not really. I'm not a really big fan of taking out that type of loan uh, for that purpose. Um, Great answer. Yeah. Great answer, man. I'm going to answer this one. Uh, I'm going to chop your name up. And my bad. Usman Rana or oh. Rena. Usman Rena. Okay. I hope I didn't chop your name up, man. Says, I want to get into real estate, into the real estate business. What is the best way to do it? That's a loaded question, only because it really depends on your circumstances. I don't believe that real estate should be a uh, cookie cutter. I don't believe, I, I believe that real estate can adapt to anybody's lifestyle. Um, that's kind of one of the things that I pride myself on when it comes to taking on coaching partners. I really try to address what their circumstances and their goals are. And then we create a strategy wrapped around that. So for example, if you need money right now, then the best thing to do if you need a if you need money, you got to build capital, wholesale real estate. If you are doing okay financially and you're just looking to build capital or place or, or park some money into assets, then buy rental properties. And there's a ton of different ways to do that, right? If you are um, loaded with capital and you're looking to really grow your money, you might want to jump into commercial real estate, right? So it just depends on where you are in your life and what your end goals are. And then you just, you, you see what the goal is and you create your steps backing off of that, right? So that's kind of a loaded question, but I hope that provides you some clarity 
with the way that I answered that question for you. All right. Um, where does, and this is a good question right here, uh, Nomi Sosi, Osasi, where does one get started with what company to start with infinite banking? Where does one get, well, you kind of get the, get the drift. Gotcha. Um, so if you're going to start with infinite banking, um, number one, it has to be a mutually owned uh, company. So, um, you know, it could be Mass Mutual, it could be Lafayette, it could be Foresters, it could be Penn Mutual, it could be uh, Guardian, right? And so kind of 1A and 1, you know, 1B, I don't even like to say which one is better than the other is usually going to be Guardian and uh, mm -hmm. Mass Mutual, right? Mm -hmm. um, the problem that you're going to run into, if you try to content tech them directly, especially for Mass Mutual uh, right now, they have released information saying that they will not write infinite banking policies. So what's going to happen to you is you're going to call and you're going to ask for an infinite banking policy and they will say no they will not issue an infinite banking policy now they can't do that if an agent structures the policy mm -hmm. <laughs> so so what i mean by that is contact DeAndre. that's what that means <laughs> and, well not well and that's not just for me but when you when you call any insurance company, just like when you call most banks, if you call the bank and ask for a first position HELOC, they will try to direct you to a home equity loan. Because a home equity loan is more beneficial for the bank itself. Mm -hmm. The same is true of the second position mm -hmm. HELOC. They will try to direct you to the second position HELOC. Why? Because now they can charge you on the second position HELOC when you use the money. And they're still getting the money from the mortgage, right? So the same is true when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about infinite banking policies. The insurance company is not in a rush to take out eighty percent, ninety percent of the cost. They're not. So a lot of times people try to do this on their own, and they kind of run across this this brick wall where the insurance company will issue them a 50 50 policy. The insurance company will issue them a standard traditional policy. And then you'll see tons and tons of YouTube videos out there saying that infinite banking is a scam because people don't know that you really do need an agent who knows what they're doing. You cannot just get this directly from the company. You have to get an agent to sit with you and go over it. And I'm not saying that I have to be that one. I would love to. I'm but saying you need you have to, to have be an that agent. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to just sound like a sales pitch or anything. I, so, I, you know, I'm very honest. I'm very genuine um, about, you know, if you're trying to accomplish it, you, you have to be deliberate and trying to accomplish it with an actual person who knows what they're doing. Yeah, for sure. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, one of them came, well, two of them came from one person. We're going to get to that one in just a second. Before we get into that, Mike LaFontaine said, can you use a HELOC to fund a whole life policy in full, then borrow from your whole life to pay back your HELOC? <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> So, so Mike, um, Mike, you can, you know, in, in short, yes, you can. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of a client who uh, needed to pay off their, what was it? They actually paid off their home. So uh, he, he did a deal, had a lot of money that came in from the deal, said, hey, I want to, I want an infinite banking policy. Uh, we wrote the infinite banking policy for basically the amount of the deal. The amount of the deal was huge, but the amount of money he had left on his home was about 90000 So he said, all right, I want a first position HELOC because I want liquid. So we then took the 90 some thousand and put it into 
the property to pay the property off and open up the HELOC. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so he's getting the benefit of the dividend from the money that he used. He opened up the HELOC, the house is completely paid off, and now he can use those funds whenever he wants to, or he can now transition and, you know, because he just opened up a huge pot of money that was bigger than the amount of money he sent. So he can do that. Um, yeah. So just don't cheat yourself in that mm -hmm. example. And I want to make sure that that's clear. So, yes, you can do that. Um don't uh, don't just take money from your HELOC, keep it there, and then take money from your insurance policy and just keep it there. You really want to make sure that you try to keep you know um, your debt down as much as possible, even though it's not costing that much. I see Mike is not listening to me anymore after he heard me say yes, it's possible. <laughs> 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 Mike is like, yo, I like this, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's, it's you got some thinking yeah, people on this podcast, man. I hope that uh, we're hope that helps get... you out, Mike, for sure, man. Uh, <laughs> now I'm gonna try to get this name right, Bidge Bell Study U Trick. I hope I didn't chop that up, but no disrespect to your name. Uh, what is the name of the bank combines? What is the name of the bank combines the 90% LTV HELOC with the savings and will soon be going into loans for investment? I, I mean, maybe you can understand that a little bit better than I, than I did. Yeah. So, so um, one of my, well, probably my greatest partnership is with, uh, with First Savings Bank, right? Um, and they do 90% loan to value. Uh, but there are some ex exceptions in reference to the states. So I'm sorry for people in Texas, because <laughs> uh, that's probably the most common state that pops up sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, they're not uh, operating in that state currently. I do have other partners that I can point you in that direction if you do live in Texas, but it would be 80% in that case. Um, and they also do, uh, so first savings does not do investments at this time, but they are looking into it eventually. So if you do want a, a direct introduction, book a call with me and I could actually get you directed to, you know, uh, an originator immediately. Um, and, you know, they'll know that you know a little bit about it. Or if you, even if you want me to do calculations for you to see if this is supposed to work for you and how well it could work for you, if it is a good fit. Um, typically when I'm introducing people to this strategy, they want it to be people who really know what to do and really understand that, oh, this is how I'm supposed to use this tool. And uh, you have the hand holding, uh, you know, because they kind of bring me in on the cases yearly. I'll also be able to do a review with you and see where you're at. See if you're able to pay off some of this you wanted to get rid of. See if you were able to buy some additional properties and different things like that and how that's working out for you. And just manage keeping your cost of the HELOC down as much as possible. Cool, cool, man. Second part of that question. What is the... At what is average cost of getting an agent to structure infinite banking policy? Got you. So um, the average cost of getting an agent to structure an infinite banking policy. So um, that is, uh, it it's kind of funny to say average because it's not necessarily average, but um, your, your cost is going to be in the lower percentage. So when you hear me say 90-10, when you hear me say 80-20, basically what I'm doing is saying that the portion that I'm really going to get uh, any compensation off of is going to be that smaller portion, right? The 10% or the 20%. Now, the reason why that's so important, I'm not sure how many of you have ever done insurance. Most people, when they're doing insurance, we get into business and we're like, hey, I need a 90% contract or up. I get 100% on the first year's premium, 120, 130. 
So I'm locking in what that percentage is by cutting off how much I can get paid off of. So, um, you know, for instance, and this will kind of give you an idea of how kind it can be. There was a client who did a $40,000 policy and I got paid maybe 600 and some change off of it in the first month, right? That's not a lot of money to write these type of policies. So um, just want you to, <laughs> Rich, <laughs> I got you, Rich. <laughs> Shout out Rich, to I appreciate you, love it all, man. It's been a, it's been a wild ride. I, I was at a conference last last week, actually the last two weeks. Uh, so I will be with you, Rich. I appreciate you uh, hopping on, man. That was hilarious. Um, <laughs> Demetria, pleasure, pleasure seeing it's you hop pleasure. on as well. Yo, I really um, appreciate my man Mike yeah. Lafontaine, that man. Really, really uh, livening up the comments, man. We really appreciate you, man. But look, I think that's it, man. That's all of, all of the questions that we have right now. Listen, if you guys want more Q&A sessions like this, I know some of the stuff that we teach are a little more advanced. And then we have some stuff that are that's more beginner friendly. Um, either way, you know, um, I'm happy to do live Q&As. If you want this to be a regular part of my uh, content for the channel, uh, do me a favor and just uh, leave a like on this video. Um, let me know that you know this is what you want. I'm trying to provide you with what you want so that you so that you can get what you need in order to be able to get to where you want to go. All right. So uh, in order for for us to do that and to be successful at it, um, I have to know what you guys are interested in. You know, at the end of the day, I know that you know. Several videos on the channel are starting to really do really well. Um, I actually just crossed 75,000 subscribers today. Well, I'm at least on my way to approaching it. Let me just double check it, which is uh, pretty big for my channel considering just a couple months ago we were at a fraction of that. Um, I know. You know, we, we should be hitting. I got <laughs> some stuff planned for. The hundred thousand dollar, the hundred thousand subscriber. Um, uh, I don't even want to call it a reunion, but when we hit a hundred thousand subscribers, I got something planned for it. I'm excited for that. Uh, I do want to continue to provide you guys with a ton of value. Uh, one of my videos, I'm excited to say this, man, it's, a, it's approaching 1.3 million views, which is just crazy right now. Uh, so I know that you guys are, are really looking for rental property information, wholesaling information, real estate investing, right? Infinite banking. The, mm -hmm. DeAndre and I just, we, we did multiple videos, but there's one tied to a HELOC, which got over 20,000 views so far. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of gauging that to see what you guys really want to see, you know? So um, we're just, uh, you know, just trying to provide you with value trying to provide you with content and trying to help as many people as possible. Uh, whether you are looking to join a coaching program or not, you, you guys know I don't really pitch anything on my channel. That's not what this is about. It's about really providing value and helping people. And if you decide at some point that you want to take the relationship further, then we can have that discussion. But I'm never going to ask you for it. Um, but I appreciate you guys joining us, participating in this uh in this Q and A, and I will be doing more of them. <clears throat> Excuse me, I will be doing more live Q and As. Uh, make sure that you you reach out. Let me know what you're struggling with. Uh, I'm thinking about doing them. You know, I keep saying it. I, I'm planning on doing this once a month, one you know, once every other week or whatever the case may be. I think I've been doing it like once every other month at this point. But you know, we'll figure it out, right? And. Uh, I just want to make sure that when I do do them, I'm all in. Um, I can get give you what you need at that particular time. But I definitely appreciate y'all and uh, hope that y'all have a good night. Be sure to like this video. Subscribe to this channel if you're not already. Click the notification bell. I don't like doing all that stuff, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs>
and leave a comment. Let me know what's on your mind. Let me know what you enjoyed or disliked about this this uh, particular Q and A, uh, and we'll either make the adjustment or not. All right. So I hope you have a good night. Take care. I like that. <laughs> <laughs>